And you might say, if you acted heroically properly and you played the metagame and not the game and you made the proper sacrifices, then you'd never encounter Kelly, you'd only encounter her benevolent counterpart And so then you might say, well does she even exist then? And that's something that's very interesting, is because the degree to which the terrible part of the world manifests itself in your life is proportionate to how insufficient you are and we don't know the full extent of that, if you got your act together completely maybe all the suffering would disappear from your life or at least maybe all the unbearable suffering and maybe all the suffering or the unbearable suffering from the lives of people around you too and you already know that because there are people that you'll go to in a crisis that you can rely on and you know they'll help you and you wonder what the world would be like if you were like that and everyone else was like that too we'd have a lot fewer crises and the ones that we do have would be a lot more manageable and so when people say, well why is the world so rife with suffering, one answer to that is because we're not yet what we could be and at least that's an answer that we have some control over, right? you're not going to talk God out of making the world suffer, that's for sure and you're not going to negotiate directly with mother nature but you might be able to put yourself together a little bit and see if that works at least it's under your control and God only knows what the upper limit of that might be well, here's the decomposition of the, of the fundamental archetype the dragon of chaos differentiates, on the one hand, into the feminine, that's the unknown and the feminine differentiates further into the negative feminine and the positive feminine the negative feminine is the reason for witch hunts, it's the reason for um, you know, there's a whole group online called men going their own way, MGTOW that's a very interesting group to go study, there's lots of them, I don't know how many of them there are and most of them are older, many of them are men who've been through a particularly horrifying divorce for one reason or another and they're, they've had enough of women, so they, they tell the young men that they're teaching never have a permanent relationship, never share your territory with a woman, never share your possessions make sure you never li live together and don't stay with one long enough to enter a common law relationship because you'll be stripped of everything that you have well that's a hell of a thing to be telling people but what's happened is that the female has been manifested in their life only as the negative archetype and they've got that confused with all women and that's partly, you know, you got to ask yourself if you know the mythological stories maybe if you made the right sacrifices you wouldn't have so much trouble with women it's a, it's a good question to ask yourself first and, and I would also say you know, if you're a woman who has trouble with men or you're a man who has trouble with women it's not the women and it's not the men, it's you because the women are telling you what's wrong with you and the men are telling you what's wrong with you and if you don't listen, then it's you it's either you or all men well that's easy, it's all men well that's certainly how it's played out in the world right now it's like, no, it's not all men you can be sure, by definition by definition and it's not all women, that's for sure I don't want to have anything to do with women it's like you're a pathetic weasel that's the same statement here's some lovely representations this is Mary from, represented in, in, in very different eras this is a very old one, this is about 12th century I absolutely love this image, it's so profound so what you see here is Mary as, in, as eternal mother of the infant Okay, she's sitting on the crescent moon here she's queen of the night and underneath, you can't see this very well, but underneath the moon there's a, there's a reptile and she's got it crunched nice, nicely underneath her feet and that's Satan in part, which means protect your children from, malevolent, from malevolence and it's the predator, and so what's the, what's the proper orientation for a mother? protect your infant from malevolent predators obviously, right? that's the holy image of the mother so she's holding the infant safely in her arms she's queen of the universe and she's coming out of this strange tunnel it's the same, these are called a mandorla by the way, this tunnel and it, it's, it's actually this is going to be very strange but I'm going to tell you what it is anyways it's like a hole into the fabric of time and space and it's revealing an, an image that's eternal that's outside of time and space and it's outside of time and space because it recurs all the time it never ages that, it's, 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 it's an image that transcends temporality now you might say, well, is it real? and the answer to that is, well, it depends on what you mean by real something that transcends temporality is pretty damn real and so that's, that's what that, that, that hole in the sky represents it also represents the place from which all forms emerge so there's a biological component to it too right, so it's as if the, 
as if these divine figures are standing in front, well I'll show you in a minute of what they're standing in front of, and you see here the same thing with these little puti, that's what they're called, sort of embedded in the flesh like folds along, around here and you see Mary here holding the infant again away from the terrible predator, that's the serpent of chaos down there in the, in the ocean and that's again, what does that mean? why would the serpent of chaos be in the ocean? well how many of our ancestral infants do you suppose were eaten by crocodiles at the water hole? And plenty plenty of them, and so that's something to be terrified of and to take precautions against and so, and then this image here, the older one see all these weird little figures in the background here you can't see them, but they're musical instruments they're, they're all sorts of archaic musical instruments and so here's, here's what the image means, it means the, the potential from which this figure is emerging is like a musical construction, so it's like a symphony it's this patterned layer it's patterns, layer upon layers of harmonious patterns that make up being and out of that emerges this image and that's what that image represents and that's what music represents, it represents this patterned potential that we're constantly interacting with it's deeply, deeply meaningful that's why we love music so much uh, but th that's an absolute work of genius to put those two things together it's, it's, it's remarkable, remarkable image so Well, let's stop there, and we'll meet again in 15 minutes and then this, so that's the positive feminine on the left and then on the right, that's the gorgon, and, and that's the thing that fills you with terror when you look at it there's another representation of the positive feminine, it's another representation of Mary there are representations very much like this of Isis with Horus on her lap and people often consider those precursors, they're Egyptian, Egyptian statues, precursors to the Christian iconography and well, I suppose in some sense they are, in so far as they predated them in time but the, the fundamental issue is that well, that, this image has to be held up as transcendent and by that I mean, it's, it's got to be, it's an image that's got to be at the basis of a value structure that actually works in so far as there's going to be human beings because there aren't any human beings without the infant and the mother and so if that's not held up as, a, as an image of, of ultimate value, then everything falls apart and it's something our culture does extraordinarily badly I had a client recently admit to me in ashamed tones that she wanted to have children I thought, and I said, well you don't have to be ashamed of that, especially not if you're talking to me and she said, oh that's such a relief because I can't talk to anyone about it at work they, they seem to think that it's, you know, degrading I thought, that you can hardly diagnose a culture as more pathological than than that, that's so appalling and it's so hard it's one of the things I really feel badly for young women because they're not guided through this with any sense whatsoever and I'll tell you what my experience has been working with women and you can take this for what it's worth and, and I've worked with women who've achieved the highest levels of their profession I don't mean just in academia but in a number of different fields this is what happens we'll, we'll take the typical woman, conservative woman because they're more typical, conscientious not particularly open, so they're, they're dutiful people, you know, they're existing within the structures of their society so I'll take female lawyers as a classic example, so they're very good in high school, very hard working, very intelligent but very, but very dutiful and often rather agreeable and that's important because it means to some degree that they want to please and they'll do what they're told and so part of the reason I think that women are outperforming men in in elementary, junior high school, high school and university is because they're more likely to be obedient and I know that to some degree because we did analysis of students in Quebec and found out that one thing that predicted grades over and above intelligence and conscientiousness was agreeableness and agreeable people got better grades than their IQ and conscientiousness would predict and that's particularly negative for men, so imagine this is what's happening so you're a borderline student and you're also a bit rebellious and antisocial, I'm going to fail you like you're right on the cusp, don't like you much, you fail you have exactly the same grade profile, but I like you tick, you move ahead, you don't and so one of the things that's dividing men from women as they progress through school is the degree to which they're agreeable now that works out to some degree for women insofar as the agreeableness moves them forward but they encounter the negative elements of being agreeable later in their careers anyways their women are very good in high school, then they go to college, they're very good in college they nail their damn grades, they do their studying, they get their 
A's and they, and they ace their LSATs so they're smart too then they go off to do their articling and they're really really good at it and then they get offered an associate position and they're really really good at it and then by the time they're 30 they make partner and let's say they're in high pressure high paying jobs $250,000 a year, $300,000 a year, $500 an hour okay, what's your life like? you work all the time period 70 hours a week, 75 hours a week flat out and you don't get to make any mistakes and if your client calls you at 3 in the morning on, Monday, on Sunday you say, I'm really glad to hear you hear from you, because if you don't there's some hot law firm in New York that'll take your client from you at a moment's notice and the client is paying you, whatever, the firm, $750 an hour, of which maybe you get $350 and what they want is an answer about something really complicated, right bloody now and you can say all you want about the fact that women have a difficult time with that because it's a male dominant patriarchy any, any female lawyer who's hit 30 and is a partner that has any sense at all knows that's complete bloody rubbish it's market determined right to the core what happens to the women when they're in their 30s? they all leave the high-end law firms why? because who in their right mind would want to live like that? that's the issue, right? once you make about $60,000 a year for your family, but let's say for you personally additional income makes zero, has zero impact on your quality of life zero so why work 80 hours a week? well, men will do it, some men, very few a handful of hyper-competitive men who are obsessed with hitting the pinnacle of the given dominance hierarchy they're in will happily work 80 hours a week and they'll forego everything else relationships, family, children way in the second category and so those men are often very difficult to live with too because they're so obsessed with their career it's hard to have a relationship with them and maybe they don't have much of a relationship with their kids but they're damn good at what they do and part of that is, is they're smart and disciplined, and they'll work non-stop all the time it's like an obsession and that's the sort of people who run things those are the people who run things well, they're often also disagreeable too because you want to, you want to manage people? really? they're not going to like you you know, and it's not an easy thing to not be liked and actually, if you're an agreeable person and women are more agreeable than men it's quite painful to be disliked but if you're in a managerial and executive position the probability that people are going to like you is quite low now, if you're a real son of a bitch then they're going to dislike you more but it's, it's, those, those positions are very stressful partly because of the interpersonal dynamics and they're also incredibly, incredibly competitive so the women hit that at 30 and they're completely qualified and the law firms are bloody desperate to keep them because it's really hard to find highly qualified people especially once you've put all that time into training them especially if they're also good at bringing in business the law firms trip over themselves to try to keep them they can't the women think why in the world am I doing this? why in the world would anyone in their right mind do this? especially because they're often married by that point too and generally they've married a husband who makes as much money or more than them so they don't need the damn money and so they think well, there's more to life than this which is exactly the right thing to think and so then they go and find a job that's 9 to 5 and controllable so that they can hire a nanny and have some kids and have a life and it's like, yes, that's the intelligent thing to do so we've got things backwards in our culture we're thinking, at least in part why aren't there more women in positions of power? wrong question the right question is why are there any men at all who want those positions of power? because it's not just positions of power you have to be such a knothead to think that oh, it's a position of power it's like, sure but it's a position of overwhelming responsibility and if you make mistakes, you're done right? it's not like you occupy that position of power and everyone does what they're told all the time and your life is easy it's like, forget about that people are on your case to do exactly the right thing all the time, 100% of the time and maybe you want that, and maybe you don't so the, what, I don't know what people think is these people are all sitting in their offices with their like, feet up on the desk smoking cigars and oppressing the world it's like, that isn't how it works those people, they work flat out all the time so, and it's fine if that's what you want and some people are like that they're hyper-industrious people, right? from a trade perspective no matter where you put them if you put them in a forest with an axe they just wander around chopping down trees non-stop, right? because it's built into them but if you want to have a balanced life, and, and you should want that, you know, because the other thing you'll find, and this is God's gospel truth, is that the older you get, if you have any sense at all, the more important your family is to you. 
like the, the, the utility of your career, maybe that peaks around 35 or 40, and it starts to decline pretty rapidly after that, and what happens if you're fortunate, you have someone in your life that you love, that you've woven yourself together with, and you have some kids, so that you have something to do from the time you're 50 till the time you're 80 and so it's a real mistake, it's a barren future without children, man, I can tell you that, it's a real mistake and so we do a terrible job of, of say, putting that image forward and saying, well, yeah, now you know, because women have access to the birth control pill now and can compete in the same domains as men, roughly speaking there is a real practical problem here it's partly an economic problem now, because when I was roughly your age it was still possible for a one income family to exist well, you know that wages have been flat, except in the upper 1% since 1973 why? well, it's easy what happens when you double the labor force? What happens? You have the value of labor. So now we're in a situation where it takes two people to make as much as one did before. So we went from a situation where women's career opportunities were relatively limited to where they were relatively unlimited and there were two incomes to where, and so women could work, to a situation where women have to work and they only make half as much as they would have otherwise. And now we're going to go into a situation, this is the next step, whereas women will work because men won't. And that's what's coming now. So we, there was an economics, e economist article showing that 50% now of, of boys in school are having trouble with their basic subjects. And you look around you in universities, you can see this happening. I've watched it over decades. I would say 90% of the people in my personality class are now women. There won't be a damn man left in university in 10 years, except in the STEM fields. And it's a complete bloody catastrophe and it's a catastrophe for women, because I don't know where the hell you're going to find someone to, to, have a, you know, to marry and have a family with if this keeps happening so, and you think when you're 19, because you're so clueless when you're 19, you don't know a bloody thing you think, well, I'm not really sure I want children anyways, it's like, oh yeah, you tell how well you've been educated <laughs> Jesus, dismal, dismal without fail, I've got to tell you, without fail, I've watched women go through their professional careers, many, many of them it's a very rare woman who at the age of 30 doesn't consider having a child her primary desire and the ones that don't consider that generally, in my observation, there's something that isn't quite right in the way that they're constituted or looking at the world sometimes you get women who are truly non-maternal, you know, by temperament they're, they have a masculine temperament, disagreeable, they're not, they're not particularly compassionate, they're not maternal they don't really, they're not that interested in kids, fair enough, man, but there aren't that many of them and there's plenty who will not admit to themselves that that's what they most desperately want Do you think women would be better off if they had kids earlier to focus on career, say in their 30s? <sighs> who knows? Like it's like it really is a problem Yeah, it's a really tough one, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that because, because I mean, if, you're, if you're 35 and your kids are say 10, 11 yeah. then you can go get a bachelor's degree, get your master's well, it seems, it seems more easy that way. Yeah, than having the career first and then trying to raise young kids. Yeah, I I, I can't answer that because I've seen women do a good job of it both both ways, and you do get the odd woman who manages a high-powered career and kids. But Jesus, those women, man, like they 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 buy more powerful microwaves because it'll take forty-five seconds to cook the food instead of a minute. And I'm not kidding, it's like they're, they're up at five, they exercise for half an hour, they make breakfast, they get their kids ready to work, they go to work, they work 14 hours, 14 hour days, flat bloody out, they come home and work for another two hours to get their kids organized, they have a nanny to, to help them out, and then they work for two more hours before they go to bed at like one, and then they're up at five and they do that again. And I'll tell you, you better be tough if you're going to do that, physically too, because you'll just burn yourself to a crisp. I've seen some women manage it, you know, but they're like, they're tough, and they're rare, because that's a hell of a, a hell of a regimen and then if anything goes wrong, you know, you have a sick kid or something like that or there's any sort of crisis in your family, it's just you know, it, it's, then it becomes too much and I don't know the answer to that, you know, I mean the advantage women have is they live about eight years longer than men because testosterone kills men so, yeah, but they have a limited time to have children, right? well, that, that, that's right, they pay up front yeah. and, and gain on the, on the, on the, in the long run but how, it isn't clear how our society should sort this out we don't know, and it's partly, we don't know what to do now that women have control of their reproductive function 
It's a big mystery. Yep. Um, I don't have an answer to that either. But I think from a practical aspect, and this goes for both men and women, even if women were to enter the workforce later on, they'd be at competition with people who are younger. And that's always a conflict in the workforce. And people are always hiring younger yeah, talent um, because of how long they can be in the workforce. Yep. Yes, well, and the thing is, young, stupid people have the advantage of being young. Middle-aged stupid people have the disadvantage of being middle-aged. And so if you're going to hire a young stupid person or a middle-aged stupid person, you'll go for the young stupid person. And I'm, by stupid, I mean, you know, not, not, I'm being sarcastic, obviously, but I, I mean without, without experience and just getting started in the world. You're much more likely to favor someone young because there's an instant explanation for their relative cluelessness. And it's a problem, you know. So, so I don't know what the answer is, but one, one answer certainly is, at, at least in part, is to start letting young women know what being 30 and being female is like. Because, and also to disabuse them of the notion that there's something magical about a career. First of all, most people don't have careers, man. They have jobs. And the reason you get paid for a job is because you're being asked to do things you wouldn't do unless you were being paid. And so it's not, it's, not some, it's not some utopia of cigar smoking with your boots up on your desk, that's for sure. Not, not that that would be such a utopia to begin with. But, all right, so, so anyways. So this is more differentiation of the archetype fundamentally. So you see the dragon of chaos here, that potential manifesting itself into this ambivalent feminine figure, both, both promise and threat, and then I've I've mapped this one out, so the ambivalent feminine figure, so sort of multivalent, gives rise to the positive mother, and then the positive mother gives birth to the hero. And that's Hercules there. And this, I like this image a lot. So Hercules is in this container. So that's, that you can interpret that both as something feminine, the container, but also as a representative of culture, because it's a boat that's floating on the chaotic ocean here. So that's Hercules. He has to be in a container that sustains him in, in the murky water of chaos. And you see, he's going out into the unknown, and he's got a lion skin on. And that's partly because one of the initiation rituals for, for young men, when there were lions, say, in the Middle East, and that wasn't very long ago, was that you had to go out and kill a lion with a spear, or with a bow and arrow, or something like that. It's like, that's, you know, impressive, all things considered. I mean, you really think about that for a minute. You really want to go out and try to kill a lion with a stick? It's like... It probably, you probably wouldn't be quite the same after you did that, that would be my guess. And so anyway, so there's Hercules, he's got his lion skin on, and that shows that he's assimilated to the lion, the dominant sort of animal, and that he's also mastered it, and he's got his bow and arrow, to, so he's, he's going to hit the target properly, he's, not, he's someone who doesn't sin, because he can hit the center of the target. And he's got this club, which I really like, because it's covered with eyes. Just like Marduk, the Mesopotamian hero. Well, what do you want to do when you go out into the unknown? It's like, arm yourself and pay attention. And so, that's what you're trying to produce if you're a good mother, is this figure that can go out into the unknown armed, accurate, and able to pay attention. And that's a hell of a thing to participate in. It's really fun. I found having children incredibly entertaining. It's a ridiculously entertaining thing to do, because for a bunch of reasons. One is that it's the only relationship you'll ever have in your life where you, where you actually have a chance of establishing something that's close to perfect is with your kids. Because when they're delivered to you, so to speak, they're, they're, in some sense they're perfect. And your job is to maintain that perfection, if you can. And you do that by being a good parent, by being encouraging, by being on their side, by taking care of them. And you can have an absolutely pristine relationship with the child. That doesn't mean it's not full of trouble, because it is. But it's... It, it can easily be the best relationship you'll ever have in your life. And, and, and in fact, I think that's, it can be the worst, too. And, you know, sometimes you get unlucky and your child is sick mentally or physically and things fall apart and it's not your fault. But, and sometimes it is your fault, but it's a real gift. And you, you have to play this game of protection and encouragement, right? Protection and encouragement. And get that dynamic right. And then you build, you help someone develop into something that's, well, exactly this, that can take on the trouble of the world forthrightly. And man, that's what you want. That'll make it worthwhile, that's for sure. Now, let's see, I've got to figure out where I want to go next. Well, I've talked about the dragon fight, so I won't do that. Oh, yes, we might as well look at some of the... the we'll look at the same thing on the patriarchal side of the equation. So, the, it's the, 
great father and the great mother that emerge out of chaos, let's say that um, you, you can think about that over the evolutionary time span too because it's the fundamental differentiation of life into one, into two sexes, and, you know, the fundamental differentiation of being into two sexes that interact creatively to produce, to produce new being it's a very very deep motif and so the dragon of chaos differentiates itself into the great father and that's God the father, that's an image there and you see he's sitting in front of the sun and the sun is behind him and the sun is the thing that comes up out of the darkness in the morning and then shines the light on everything with which we can see and then collapses again into the darkness at night, right? and so in, at night it fights its battle with the forces of darkness and chaos and emerges triumphant in the morning And that's why we have solar gods, because the, the, the highest deity is assimilated to the dominant, the dominant phenomena in the sky and well, and, and no wonder, because the sun is also what gives life and that provides light and that does send the darkness away, and to notice that there's something symbolically useful in that, that you can also apply to the ideal person, is another act of, of conceptual metaphoric genius and so behind God the Father is the Son, S-O-N, Son and you see, he's ruling over a walled city here, and you can think about God the Father here as the spirit of the walled city that's a good way of thinking about it and so, and why, what does that spirit mean? well, forget about the supernatural element of this, or the transcendent element of it even how do you represent society? okay, you've got your walled city okay, why is it walled? that's the fundamental structure of a city, why is it walled? well, because you have to have a border between what's yours and what isn't yours, or a border between your territory and the outside world, right? otherwise it's not delineated and defined so the first thing is, it's something that's walled off, it's a, it's a defined space inside that, there's a dominance hierarchy it's a masculine dominance hierarchy, because like chimps, our fundamental dominance hierarchy is masculine ok, so the dominance hierarchy is, what's the same across all the men? and then it's more than that, it's, it's, what's, it's what's the same across all men, insofar as they found their position in the dominance hierarchy insofar as they're supporting it insofar as they're expanding it, and insofar as they're trying to strive up it so it's averaged across that, but then it's more than that, because it's not just the men that live now it's also the men that used to live, and the men that will live and you think, what are you relating to when you relate to other people? well, in part, you're relating to the spirit of the men that will soon live and that's what a contract is, right? you make a contract with the potential society of the future it's embodied as a spirit, and so you act appropriately in relationship to the patriarchal spirit because if you act in accordance with that structure then you can extend your contractual relationship with other people across time it's brilliant, it's a brilliant conceptualization that's independent of any supernatural or transcendent reality I'm not saying it exists in, in necessary opposition to such things, I'm just saying that you don't have to introduce the idea of such things into the conceptualization in order to understand the symbolism now I think it's more complicated than that, because if you think about this thing as a spirit a spirit is an essential pattern of personality, let's call it that to the degree that you're a well-civilized representative of the social world you are actually inhabited by that spirit and so what should happen as you mature is that as you become older, you should become God the Father that's what you're aiming at, you want to embody that central spirit that characterizes the civilization and that spirit's very complex, and that's why you see, often see it in relationship with the representation of God the Son because the masculine spirit isn't, the spirit in general, the spirit of civilization isn't exhausted by its patriarchal representation, that's the dogmatic form, like Osiris, right? it's only the structure that has to be allied with the thing that keeps the structure alive so you want to be both of those things at the same time the embodiment of the civilization and the force that transforms it and moves it forward and that's what you're supposed to be being, be being taught that's what university is for, well that's what it used to be for now it's mostly there to produce politically obsessed idiots oh. anyways, sorry about that, but it gets very frustrating so, alright, so that you get the picture, that's what, that's what that represents, that's what it's trying, that's, 
that's an idea that's been trying to emerge in the human imagination since the beginning of time and it's not a trivial idea, it's an unbelievably profound idea and it, it differentiates too and this is what makes it complicated what kind of relationship do you have with your father? your real father? it's often ambivalent, right? because there is an element of him that encouraged you, hopefully because without the encouragement of your father, man, the world is a dismal place it's very difficult to be a courageous person unless you have your father in, in body and spirit behind you, it's very de demoralizing like, it really kills people not to have their mother, they just don't recover from that but, and, and I think people can recover from a fragmented father relationship, but it's the next worst thing you know, because if your father rejects you or doesn't form a relationship with you, it's as if the spirit of civilization has left you outside the walls as of little worth, it's very difficult for people to recover from that so the father should be an encouraging force, but can be a tyrannical and crushing force and so that's very, that's a very difficult thing to get right, partly because if you're my son, then I should impose the highest standards of behavior on you and I should always be judging what you're doing, I should be judging it with with the aim of making the best in you come forward but, but getting that balance exactly right is very difficult and so it's easy to, for a father to swing too much into judgment, let's say and then of course mothers can play this role too to swing too far into the domain of judgment and to be too harsh and to the degree that the father has his own pathologies he's going to do that imperfectly you know, he might be someone who's, who's uh, the father who devours his son because he's jealous of the new possibility, the new potential, the, the struggle for, for uh, attention and love from the mother or from the other children in the family, there's all sorts of things that can go terribly wrong so that's the father as wise king, and that's another symbol that's been lost, I would say, to a massive degree in modern universities because all we're taught is to tear that down and, and to not even notice that it manifests itself everywhere, especially in the universities, which are like they're as close to an ideal environment as you could, as human beings have ever been able to create it's as simple as that and if you can't be grateful for, for the structure of the university with all its imperfections then, then you're completely blind to this element of the archetype and that's the opposite of it, that's the son that devours, the king that devours his own son that's a tyrant you know, that's like the mother who's too overprotective, it's the male version of that and the mother that's too overprotective says, I'll never let anything happen to you it's like, well maybe you actually want to have something happen to you you know, it's a bit of an all-inclusive statement it's like, no, I'm going to make you strong so any number of things can happen to you and when, you're, when you need some care, I'll be there, but otherwise, like out into the world with you that's the right attitude, and for the father, it's like, get your bloody act together but I'm on your side, it's because not because I want to destroy you or demean you or push you down in the dominance hierarchy but because I want the best in you to emerge and so uh, you need standards, it's like, what are you doing wasting your life? there's way more than that to you get your act together and, and bring it out and that's a message that people really want to hear if they have any sense at all and generally they do want to hear it so, you know I was talking, I've been talking to a lot of people recently as, as per perhaps you know and I was talking to one of the leaders of the conservatives this morning and they're, they're asking me about, the person was asking me about Bill C-16 but more specifically about talking to young people because the conservative leadership struggle is going on right now, I've been talking to a bunch of them and I said, well look, one of the things you could do for young people that no one's doing is to talk to them about responsibility because everyone talks to young people about rights it's like, we need our rights, it's like, oh god how many rights do you need? you know, really, like you have more privileges than any people who've ever lived anywhere well, it's so dull to hear, it's so dull, it's so pathetic and, and uh, what would you call it, it's so demeaning that you have to be protected and have your rights it's like I said, there's a huge marketplace for responsibility that's what you want to talk to young people about it's like, get your act together and do something worthwhile with your life for the first time in my entire adult life the conservatives actually have something to sell young people, right? they could sell them responsibility it's like, well why? because that's where me life has meaning with responsibility the more responsibility you take on, the more meaning your life has and the, 
the higher degree of responsibility that you agree voluntarily to try to bear, the richer your life will be. And no one's ever told that, and it's the case. You know, it's like you have, you have four kids, say. Well, that's plenty of responsibility. You're going to have meaning. It's going to be rough, you know, because it's complicated. You have a complicated job, and you try to help the careers of the people around you. You try to solve tough problems, and aid suffering, and do all of that. It's like, it's weight. It's responsibility, but it's, there's glory in it, there's real glory in it, there's deep meaning in it and, and, and young people are starving for that because no one ever tells them that It's like, you're way more than you think, man, stand up, do something difficult Do something difficult and heroic, right? Burst out of your bonds It's like, that's a good message It's a necessary message Because we have to be more than we are, because if we if we aren't, we're not going to survive Well, that's the sun devouring father That's a painting by Medina of Satan It's a pretty horrifying one And that's Captain Hook I really like the figure of Captain Hook Some of these popular mythological stories, myth-based fairy tales, modern fairy tales, have got things really right Captain Hook, well, he's a pirate So. I think I told you that in the Google engineer's investigations of female sexual fantasies, the pirate played a large role Werewolf, vampire, pirate, surgeon, billionaire Incredibly comic comical Well, pirate, you know, captain of the high seas and someone willing to break rules There's a romance in that figure Well, so the idea of the great father as the pirate is a good one Well, C Hook is kind of a pathetic pirate And, of course, pirates are precisely that, because they're also crooked and so what makes him pathetic? Well, it isn't because he's got a hook, precisely Because maybe that's just the sign of adventure It's because he's being chased by a crocodile with a clock in its stomach Well, that's the dragon of chaos, right? That's time, tick, tick, tick Your life is going to end It's already got a piece of you And it's coming for the rest And so Hook is terrified of that He's terrified into resentment and, and, and evil, roughly speaking It's why he can prey on other people and so that's the father in the Peter Pan story, out in Neverland, which is the archetypal domain Captain Hook's the father Well, why would Peter Pan want to grow up to be Captain Hook? Well, he doesn't And so he stays Pan Pan means everything, right? Like pantheism He stays everything, he's this divine child, he never wants to grow up Well, why would you sacrifice the potential of youth to become nothing but a death-obsessed tyrant? Well, that's the story in in Peter Pan, and of course Wendy's in this story, and so is Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell is the imagined feminine. She's just he, she doesn't even exist. She's just this perfect little thing that's always around whenever Peter Pan needs her. But the problem with Tinkerbell is that she's a fairy, and fairies don't exist. He has Wendy there. She's a real girl. She grows up and actually marries someone. Peter Pan stays king of the Lost Boys forever. And, you know, maybe it's better to be king of the Lost Boys but n than not to be king at all, but maybe not too King of the Damned is not exactly something to, it's not a dominance hierarchy to strive for dominating So that's the Peter Pan story And it's, a right, it's the right story for the modern age, that's for sure So, that's a negative element of the Great Father Here's a positive element of the Great Father These are both, this is a representation of Moses receiving the the, the rules for living from God on high Well, we talked about that already, you know And I see that, that's a story of the revelation of structure and That's the story of mankind We're acting out a moral structure Well, what is it? Now and then we get a glimpse of what the moral structure is And it hits people with the force of a revelation Then it can be articulated And that's partly what the story of Moses lays out And you see here, this picture I really like this one too This is a, a supplicant, basically someone who's Who's hit hard by a divine vision It's God in heaven Again, very, very similar to this with, a, with the cross in the background And it's something like To transcend your littleness Because look, he's looking up That's what's at the top of the dominance hierarchy It's what's at the top of all possible dominance hierarchies Look up That's the father who supports the son That's transcending his own vulnerability right? Willing to bear it voluntarily And not to and not to shirk from that It's exactly right And it is what you admire in people you, know, you admire people who are courageous 
and they were strong and when you decompose that it means that they're able to act appropriately and in a helpful, compassionate, wise and tough manner despite the fact that they're beset with all of the problems of mortality that beset everyone else well, how does it go wrong? well, that's all propaganda for Hitler and look at the imagery, you know he's a knight, that's on the right he's the, he's the knight of nationalism well, that's God the Father too, you know it's a little bit one-sided, right? because there's more to the Father than the state that's the thing, and that's the problem with nationalism and its totalitarian variants and we're moving in the, that, that direction fast, right? you see Europe right now fragmenting again because the European Union is too amorphous and maybe not well enough bordered and everyone is getting nervous and they're saying back to the state, back to the state it's fair enough, fair enough you, you need to be around people who are like you, so to speak that you have built a consensus with but to subordinate yourself to the state and to make its head the, the bearer of the, 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 the archetype of the knight without having that element of individuality in it is absolutely pathological we've already been down that road, right? because the National Socialists were hyper-national just like, well, both in Germany and in Italy and it's attractive again it's interesting here, you see Hitler as a knight and up here there's a bird, you know, and that bird should be the dove because that should be the Holy Ghost if the iconography was proper but it's not, it's an eagle and an eagle is a bird of carrion eater right? it feeds on corpses well, it's worth thinking about so that's the woman worshipping the strong father another representation of Hitler as a knight and then there's Hitler as wise father you see, he's surrounded by people there who focused in on him as if he's of archetypal import and then this is a, a poster from, from the Allies an anti-Nazi poster from the Allies and you see right there that Hitler and the Nazis are assimilated to a mess of predatory snakes it's like, well, why? well, if you want to appeal to someone's determination to destroy, you say, well, here you are and you're all ready to go let's go kill some snakes, and everyone can say yes and then you say, well, there's the snakes right there and the thing is, it's true to some degree because you, you have plenty of snakes just like everyone else and so it's easy, that's the first step towards demonization and you can do it just like that it's no problem, the archetype will map perfectly especially if there's already tension between the groups or if the other group is identifiable in some manner or you can make it identifiable disgust is the best way to do that not fear, disgust fear to fear someone you have to respect them you don't want to burn everything that the person that you fear owns you want to burn everything that the person who disgusts you owns and so you'll see people who are pushing the nationalist agenda hard and Hitler did this beautifully everything that was outside of the Aryan domain of purity wasn't to be feared, it was disgusting it was contemptuous and it should be destroyed and purified by fire and that was his message the Nazis were unbelievably great at using fire of purification as a symbolic message well, it, it has an archetypal power and then you see here, this is an English uh, uh, poster from the World War II um, asking people to buy bonds to fund the American or the, the British war effort and you see these, these talon-like claws Japan and Nazi Germany reaching out to the virgin mother and her infant child right? deep, deep use of, deep subordination of archetypal imagery for the purposes, well I hesitate to say propaganda because World War II in some sense was pretty clear cut but you, you get the point and there's the uniform reoccur the uniformity of the state, right? so the goose step, everybody moves exactly the same way everybody's put, everybody's turned into exactly the same carbon copy of everyone else all the diversity is pushed out of the state it's subordinated to the supreme leader and the hierarchy becomes incredibly rigid and, 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 and homogenous it's like, well, that's great for fast action, but it's terrible if you don't know where you're going you need some diversity, you need some flaws in the crystalline structure in case you're on the wrong path and that's why you can't have everyone being the supreme leader's acolytes the whole bloody thing wanders off in one direction and because we don't know the right direction to go wandering off in a single direction is extraordinarily dangerous you will eventually fall over a cliff so there's the Nazis use of, of light at night, they were unbelievably good at their, 
at their this is one of the things that made fascism so difficult to fight because with communism, because it was a fully articulated philosophy, you could attack it rationally but fascism never really did that, what they did instead was use ritual right? huge mass rallies and highly emotionally supercharged meetings and then the use of light and fire, and so Hitler built the biggest parade grounds in human history to host the Nuremberg rallies, and he would get in front of them on this huge stage with, you know, with Greek columns, very impressive looking, and have blocks of thousands of people organized perfectly, orderly the Germans are good at order, and order is associated with disgust sensitivity incredibly organized, orderly displays, complete, and then at night with fire and behind him he would have all of the searchlights from the Luftwaffe lined up, dozens of them shooting their light straight up, miles into the sky, so we stand in front of these incredibly impressive displays of light long before there were rock shows and so forth doing that, you know, it was unparalleled in history and, and address the crowd, and he was very good at addressing the crowd he'd say something, and if people were listening, he'd say more of it, and if they were listening, he'd say more of it and because he was addressing the mob the mob got exactly from Hitler what they wanted, and we saw what that was like, right? 120 million people dead in no time flat, and the worst horrors that were ever perpetrated on people maybe, because there's no shortage of perpetrated horrors Stalin, same thing, Stalin the great father, right? wise man at the helm of the ship of the state this is after the wall came down, some old man kissing uh, a gilded statue of Stalin before it's going to be before it's going to be torn down, there he is with happy children and, and not the children that his policies starved to death, as you, as you might well imagine there he is in his military uniform, sitting on what's all, for all intents and purposes, a throne and this is, this is really an uncanny one, it's very positive right? that's Hitler, as, or Stalin as head of state, he's in this hellish mandorla of fire perfect, with God the Father at his head, that's Lenin you know, who people still who people still revere, um, you may know, and perhaps you don't, that I was nominated to be rector of the University of Glasgow and so, which is an honorary position, and um, today, yesterday, the uh, different candidates put up their manifestos and, and the student newspaper put them up and then wrote analysis of the manifestos which were biased and they were appallingly biased and one-sided and I wrote and told them that, they said, well, we have a perfect right to our political opinion and I thought, yeah, well, for sure, but you know, you are journalists after all and maybe you could be just trying to tell what's happening it's like, no, 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 there's none of that and they said that one of the candidates that they, uh, that they clearly recommended, who seems to be a, a person who's perfectly heroic in his own right, I mean, he's taken on very many difficult legal cases and, and work for the oppressed and downtrodden who clearly exist um, it was either him or another candidate, doesn't really matter that they described as bolshe and un outspoken bolshe meaning Bolshevik-like, it's like, well, you know, he's appropriately bolshe it's like, it's no different than saying, well, he's appropriately Nazi-like like, what the hell is that? I mean, w w there were 50 million people that were killed in the Soviet Union by the Bolshies and maybe twice that many in, in China, and that says nothing about Cambodia and all the other places there were radical left bloodbaths you think it's cute to call someone Bolshe? Jesus, it's appalling it's appalling, it's not some fashionable thing that you do it's a participation in some of the deepest intellectual morasses of evil that human beings have ever managed to create and yet it's fashionable it shows you what the universities are worth well there's the downside of Stalin yeah as Stalin is hangman that sort of cartoon would have gotten you killed in the Soviet Union there's Stalin as Satan himself in his stained glass representation there's a statue of Stalin covered with red paint for the blood after the wall came down there's Stalin as what it's very much like Modena's Satan, right? You look at that, and it's exactly the same archetypal idea. There's the Americans going it hat, it cap in hand to get a little largesse from Papa Stalin. That's uh, a painting of the communists forcibly collectivizing the productive farmers in the Soviet Union in the early 1920s, the kulaks, right? Everything from whom they stole and raped them and murdered them and shipped them off to Siberia and killed them and wiped out the productive farmers of the Soviet Union and then starved six million Ukrainians to death and there's some poor kid in the 1930s 
whose ribs are showing, you know, taking a bath in this pot with his eyes wide, and you know, he's one of the fortunate ones because he's still alive. It's like bullshit. Yeah, cute, pretty, fun, fashionable, lovely. Well, that's the decomposition of chaos into God the Father, half providing security and order and half providing tyranny. That's the archetype. You have to put up with it. That's what your society is like. You try to interact with it in a way that enables the positive part of it to come forth, and then it does the same thing. Chaos gives rise to the Father who's nurturing and, 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 and encouraging, and that gives rise, that produces the Son. It was very far, hard to find that image, I could tell you. So, and then that gives rise to the, the proper balance of, the proper attitude from the Father produces the same thing, the Son who's the hero, the individual who's the hero. The consciousness, the conf consciousness of the child that's willing to go forth, eyes open, and voluntarily confront chaos and turn it into order. And that's the proper pathway for human beings. So here's a way of thinking about it. I showed you that diagram, you know, of how you decompose a value structure. And you can do it right down to the level of detail, you know. So you want to make dinner. You go below that higher resolution. You cut up vegetables, you move your arm, you, it decomposes all the way, differentiates down all the way to skill. You put these skills together and you represent them with abstract concepts. I can make dinner, I can take care of my family, I can undertake this job at work. That makes me a decent father, that's part of being a good, per that's part of, of being a good person. The question is, what's at the pinnacle of that? at the upper end of the abstraction hierarchy, because these things should be organized all the way up into a complete hierarchy. What does it mean to be a good person? Well, it means, we, we've walked through it, it means you win the set of games, you go out into the world and explore, and you bring back what you've found, and you build yourself out of it, and you share it with other people. That's, that's an old, old story, that's no different than the story of the collective hunt, it's exactly the same thing, right? You, you build yourself into someone that can has a, have a long-term relationship with someone of the opposite sex, generally speaking, so that you can bring children into the world and turn them into exploratory heroes and stabilize the state. That's what should be at the top, and that thing that's at the top, it's the same thing. It's the integration of all of those things into the same thing. And that's the same as the sun, that's the same as the halo, it's the same as the thing that emerges from the belly of the whale. It's all of those things, and you also know that because you know that you have the capacity for admiration. It's in you, it's in you, it's locked into your biology, and it's locked into your sociology. You see what you admire, and that's a partial representation of the ultimate ideal. It's as simple as that. So I, I kind of nested this, eh? so I should just explain this diagram briefly. So it was a, a map I tried to make in some sense of my own identity. I mean, just using myself as an example of, of someone typically situated in society. So, you know, I have this role, which is kind of a high resolution role. I'm a father and a husband, and I also run a business. And so the father and husband thing is sort of nested inside of that because it's dependent on my economic success to some degree. And then that's nested inside a capitalist structure. And then that's nested inside, well, I said American personality, but it's sort of, that's good enough. And then that's nested inside the humanistic Western personality and inside the Judeo-Christian personality, and that's all nested inside this thing that's best conceptualized as something approximating the exploratory hero. And so that's a, that's a value structure that's, and you know, you can, different, you can differentiate that to a much higher level than father and husband, and we did that when we decomposed things right down to, you know, their motor actions. And you want, what you want, and this is, I think, there's something that's, transcendent about this. You want all those things stacked up, so they're all operating properly at the same time. All the way up, and, and all the way down, and I don't even know how far down means. Like, if you get all those things together, your physiology be organized and oriented properly too. Oh, you know, and that means your organs work properly, and the micro elements of them work properly, and all the way down. And then if everything is organized like that too, the society starts to work. And everything starts to organize itself along a horizontal axis where each level of the structure supports every other le level and you can feel that, I believe 
That's what you feel when you're engaged in doing something meaningful You can feel those things coming together And you can also feel like that, that as, a, as a kind of strength That pushes you forward instead of pulling you backwards So, and it, I, I think that your, our nervous systems are very sophisticated And they orient us in time and space And they can tell us when they're in the right place at the right time And people love that And I think you experience that when you're deeply engaged in music as well It puts you there momentarily, right? Say you're in a cathedral and you're listening to some remarkable music You have the light pouring in You're in trees Because that's what a cathedral is That's what, the, that's what the, the arches is It's light coming through the trees That's what's represented in the stones You're in there, you're looking at the light It's, it's, it's pouring down at you you're, in this, you're at the center of the world And there's a great piece of music playing And it's an, an indication that everything is stacking up along this one pole That's what it's supposed to produce that produces a religious experience if it works properly You know that, you go to rock concerts, you go listen to music So what the hell do you think you're doing there? If you're not having a quasi-religious experience You think you'd go otherwise? And just because you don't know that that's, what hap that's what's happening Doesn't mean it isn't what's happening People have been gathering together in groups And transcending the limits of their pathological individuality Through music and ritual since the beginning of time Why would it be any different for us? And the lights there, that's what the light show is for It's the same thing, it's just that the religious element of it is stripped away Partly because we've criticized that to death so carelessly that we can't integrate it anymore into ceremonies like that And I mean, fair enough But, but it's not like that comes without a loss People hunger for that more deeply than anything else Questions? Yes touched on this uh, topic uh, today, but also in your conversation with Sam Harris I um, wanted to ask, is there a relationship between the mythological idea of sacrifice and human sacrifice, or whatever type of sacrifice and the psychological idea of delayed gratification and if so, could it be a factor in the relation, in the correlation between conscientiousness and... Uh, it's, it's exactly, the question is, is there a relationship between the idea of sacrifice and delay of gratification, and is that related to conscientiousness? Yes, well, the conscientiousness relationship is a tough one You know, we tested to see if conscientious people were more likely to delay gratification In classic delay of gratification tasks, and we found no effect We found IQ effect, and we found a reverse effect for extroversion and positive mood and so, what happens is that happier people are more impulsive They're more likely to grasp what's right in front of them in the present But conscientiousness is an extraordinarily tough nut to crack And I do think it's associated to some degree with the proclivity for sacrifice of the present to the future But finding ways of testing that has proved very, very difficult So, but the, uh, the, the relationship between sacrifice and delay of gratification Those are the same words, right? Delayed gratification is a sacrifice it's, it's, And you know, there's famous experiments, you know, you may know the marshmallow experiment um, And that is, well, basically you take kids, four or so, and you say you, you sit them in a room and at a little table and you say, here's a marshmallow If you don't eat that for ten minutes, we'll come in and give you another marshmallow Right, and so the kids, and they videotape the kids, and the tapes are actually pretty funny Because the poor kids do everything they can not to look at that Candy or marshmallows, like they sit on their hands, they hum, they look at the ceiling It's like they try to distract themselves And some of them just, you know, it's like, oh, to hell with it, and they eat it <laughs> And then others can manage it, and, and those, well, the, 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 the data showed, you know and, and I wouldn't say this study has been replicated many times But the data showed quite clearly that the kids who could delay gratification at an early stage Were doing quite a bit better later in life Now, I don't know to what degree that was controlled for IQ, because such things matter But the point is, is that, well, the point is the point that you're making Is that you can delay, you can only delay gratification intelligently though if the social structure is stable Right, because basically what, if you delay gratification you're making a bargain with the potential future And the bargain is everybody's going to keep acting the same way so that the future is the same as the present Because otherwise you'll delay gratification and then everything will fall apart and you won't get your cake and you won't get to eat it And so society has to be quite stable it has to be stabilized by the contractual relationship between people before delaying gratification is a useful strategy This is also why you see um, in chaotic circumstances where the future becomes uncertain people forego delay of gratification very, very rapidly and, and, and 
perhaps appropriately so, although you can get a spiral going in the other direction. So, so could the idea of sex part be like the behavioral features that are of the psychological, sorry, the mythology, the mythological idea of sacrifice be the behavioral precursor of uh, psychological behavior gratification? Or is well, it the same thing? You know how you usually say you to, for something to become part of what you have to yeah. get out first and then become, and then understand it at least. I would say it's a chicken and egg problem because what happens as you stabilize societies being conscientious, conscientious becomes more useful and so then you're going to be selected for as a consequence of being conscientious and that's going to stabilize the society even more these are, these are roughly known as Baldwin effects so that's where let's call it a genetic transformation, produces a behavioral transformation that transforms the environment so the genetic transformation is more likely to propagate. You can get unbelievably rapid evolutionary movements when, when you get a loop like that developing. And, and they, they happen frequently. And that's, that's also how in some sense a meme can be turned into a genetic, can manifest itself genetically. So if you have an idea that spreads through the culture and it tilts the culture in a certain way such that those who hold that idea are likely to be more successful then the meme and the biology will align themselves across time and, and well I think you see that happening that's that to some degree that's what's happened as religious stories have propagated themselves as well because as, as the idea of the hero becomes clearer so to speak and then it manifests itself more clearly in the society then there's more rewards for doing it then the selection pressures get more positively related to that kind of behavior and the whole thing loops upwards so it's something like that um, in terms of treating mental health disorders where do you think we should draw the line or how should we draw the line between uh, pharmaceutical interventions and uh, various other psychotherapy methods I mean to what, at what point is depression and anxiety should be treated with medicine and at what point should it be is it a, uh... Okay, that's a good question. So the question is, how do you differentiate the utility of behavioral slash psychotherapeutic treatments for conditions like depression versus medical treatments? Okay, so the first thing I would say is, um, don't underestimate the utility of medical interventions. Depression is a cat catastrophe. It carries with it a very high suicide rate. And it also levels people out and it's really hard on their families. And so, and, it, and it's physiologically extraordinarily damaging. And so, if you're in a depressive state and it's severe, you can try an antidepressant. You'll know in a month if it works. If it works, well, maybe it'll help you get your life together. Like we could say, well, maybe you're depressed because your life isn't very well together. Could be. Sometimes people are depressed, their life is just, it isn't fine because no one's life is fine. Everyone's life is a tragedy. But sometimes people have their lives in order as much as you could expect anyone to have they have friends, they have an intimate relationship, they have a career that they like you know, they're, they're qualified, industrious people working hard on what they're doing and, and, and really playing a minimum number of games with themselves and they're terribly depressed antidepressant, man, that's, sometimes that will just fix it and so hooray, like, you're a biological entity if, if there's something out there that can help you strengthen yourself so that you can prevail great and you know people you hear everyone takes antidepressants you know everyone's taking them it's like no one takes those bloody things without serious consideration half the time i spend with my clients who are depressed is often the two years long attempt to get them to tentatively try an antidepressant because they're so guilty that they're relying on an external crutch to sort out their lives that they can't even tolerate it but you know i say well look man what if you had diabetes you're not going to take your insulin? It's like, you got stressed, you blew out at your weakest point that's what happens when you get stressed, if there's something out there that might help you it's like, try it, for God's sake, you'll know in a month and, and you just stop if it doesn't work now, having said that, you want to do a multi-dimensional analysis it's like, well do you have any friends? do you have an intimate relationship, or are you pursuing one? do you have a reasonable career? are you as educated as you are intelligent? do you have something useful to do with your time outside of work? Do you have a drug or alcohol problem? Are there other behavioral issues like sleep dysregulation and lack of eating that are contributing to the pathology? You want to differentiate all of that and wherever you can make a behavioral intervention, so much the better. 
but sometimes too you're dealing with people whose lives are so wrecked that they don't even know where to start they're different than the ones who have everything in order say and you say well try this man maybe you won't cut your throat in the next month because if you're dead it's going to be hard to work with you and so so you, medical interventions anything if you're sick you do what it's necessary to get better and you leave your pride behind if you if you have to and uh, that, that says nothing about the utility of the behavioral interventions you want to hit the problem with everything you have at your disposal but some antidepressants especially especially for people whose lives are together and who are depressed antidepressants can be absolutely miraculous so you know when you hear about the clinical evidence in their favor being iffy and that's partly because the diagnosis of depression isn't very well formulated there's, it's very different to have a terrible life than to be depressed and antidepressants can only help you so much if you have a terrible life so yeah yes <clears throat> you've spoken about um, you know, these activities that are meaningful and how our, our consciousness might be very good at identifying those and how they show themselves as a light do you, do you, you know what I'm talking about right? Mm -hmm. and I feel like uh, some things can hijack them. Some things that are not actually meaningful or useful to your life can, can make themselves... Sure. That's what the sub-personalities. Yeah. And, and yeah. video games, for example, are one Now, video games are... Okay, so the question is, can that sense of meaning be hijacked? And the answer to that is absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because you could say that the ultimate sense of meaning is composed of the union of fragmentary senses of meaning and the fragmentary senses of meaning can be overwhelmingly powerful anger, sexual lust and, and, and the sorts of things that you experience when, say when you're playing a video game which are very carefully calibrated to keep you on the, on the edge of exploration let's say now I'm not a, a foe of video games because games are complicated and it isn't clear what people are doing when they're playing them you know, they may be expanding their cognitive skills, they may be learning to cooperate, they may be learning to engage in complex problem solving and so, but part of it's also a matter of balance you know, 50 hours a week, probably not unless you're going to go pro, right? because there's other things you need to be attending to, it's not a stable solution for you, your family, your society it's too one-sided, yeah and you can get pulled down rabbit holes of all sorts that, that are one-sided pursuits of meaning so, and it's some, something we're actually going to talk about as the later classes unfold the question is how do you stop yourself from falling prey to a pathologized sense of meaning and I think one of the answers to that is don't lie because what you're hoping is that your nervous system is sufficiently healthy and well programmed so that what it reads out to you is reliable and if you pathologize your psyche by either through sins of omission let's say or, or outright deception you're going to warp that internal structure and it's not going to read out properly to you and then your sense of meaning will lead you astray so like one of the reasons for speaking the truth I shouldn't say that because you don't know how to speak the truth but you do know how not to lie and it, it's a game you're playing with yourself you can define the damn lies no one else has to do that for you, you, you you try not to utter falsehoods because you warp your neurological structure by doing so and then it will read out pathologically and then if you rely on it to guide you it will run you right off a cliff so that's why there's a moral element to this is if you're going to rely on your sense of meaning make sure that you don't pollute the mechanism see this is, this is partly why people go to confession Right, which is, which is a, like a psychotherapeutic technique it's like, okay, what stupid, miserable, wretched things did I do this week? Well, that's a good thing to, to make conscious, right? because maybe you cannot do them the next week and you think, well, why would you bother? it's like, well, you're in a ship it's sailing across the, the, the stormy seas if, if, you're, if you're hacking holes in it with a pickaxe you should probably pay attention to that before you sink so it's a good idea to keep, to keep what you're doing that's stupid in mind so that you can stop doing it and so then you can more and more rely on yourself and your, and your own, you know, your own conscience let's say, as a guide to proper action you know in the Pinocchio story is that the conscience was not an unerring guide for Pinocchio it had to learn and so, 
and so it's also partly pushing yourself into new situations and differentiating yourself so that you get wiser and, and so it's courage as well as truth those, those might be the two there's more, beauty, courage, truth, you know, the fundamental virtues yeah. why be virtuous? that's the question it's so that you can bear the suffering of life without becoming corrupt right? it's practical it's practical, there's nothing more practical than that so, unless you want misery and people do, you know it's exciting, misery so, other questions? All right then, see you next Wednesday. <laughs>